the next talk is going to be uh, by a, yes, him, um, Carlos. Carlos Espina, he's one of the first people that I met when I moved to London, and he is amazing. He's really knowledgeable, he knows a lot of things, he has a lot of experience, and he's also a partner in SIDCAMP, which is probably the biggest accelerator, or well, the most well-known accelerator in Europe. And if you want to talk to him, grab him, but don't ask him for money, ask him for knowledge, because he has a lot. <laughs> and now he's going to talk uh, about the product market fit cycle. Thank you, thank you, Anka. Is this the... Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm very excited to be back here again. Um, this is, is it, Monica, is this the third time I'm here? And um, I've seen a lot of, uh, of familiar faces, but also how the evolution of how to web has transformed the quality of the companies that are presenting. Um, for how many of you is this the first how to web? Okay, okay, so who's been here from the very first one? Okay, it's not bad actually. Um, I saw a couple of the organizers raise their hand. I don't know if that counts, but, but that's, uh, no, that's good. Look, I, I'm very happy to be here. Um, as I said, very excited about seeing you guys again and all the great work Bogdan has done in transforming this ecosystem. You guys should be very thankful to, to the team here for, for bringing all these people together because it's amazing. Um, a little bit about SeedCamp. Anka did a, uh, a brief kind of introduction about kind of what we've been doing for the last seven years. But some of you may have seen that earlier this year we raised a new fund. And although we're still, we're still in the process of um, talking about what we can do, I'd like to introduce you a little bit kind of what SeedCamp 2.0 looks like. Um, with our new fund, what we want to do is something we're calling a seed acceleration fund. We're still going to invest in companies, kind of like an accelerator, but we're also capable of investing in companies at the seed stage as part of a syndicate and helping them scale up to hit product market fit and follow on as rounds come along and they continue to succeed. So that's why it would make sense for me to talk to you a little bit about sort of the product market fit cycle. And you might be asking, well, what, how did this come about? Or, how is it that this, um, th this, this presentation kind of was derived? And it really comes from having a lot of conversations with our founders. Um, we have about 140 founders, uh, well, companies, and probably multiply by two or three for the number of founders. And we've seen a lot of the same issues come up again and again. And that is the foundation of what I want to talk to you about, is a little bit of the lessons learned from having all these founders tackling all the issues um, that come at the pre-product market fit phase. So let's focus a little bit about kind of how we are as people, right? We love to do or double down or triple down on things that we're good at, but um, the things that we don't look, we don't not so good at, we try to avoid, right? How, how many people have a to-do list category that they just don't look at, right? A lot of us, like the kind of stuff you're like, you know, I really need to rethink my marketing strategy, but I'd rather build another button. Um, so a lot of that stuff happens. And so therefore, founders can get stuck in this process of really optimizing around features, especially technical founders uh, can get stuck on optimizing features and not necessarily thinking about all the components that make up a business. And therefore, the metrics that are being measured, especially if you're metrics uh, inclined, can give you false impressions or false positives about what's going right and what's going wrong and what you should be spending time with. And therefore, you struggle with hitting product market fit before your money runs out. So before I continue on and really kind of jump into the core of what the product market fit cycle is, I want to start by defining some terms. Some of these terms you might have heard of in the past. Some of them might be new to you. So bear with me. You might find them fun. Um, the first one is product market fit. So one of the things is this term that people toss around is actually a very nebulous one. It's not like um, I hit a monthly recurring revenue rate of this. You know, this is a very nebulous one. It doesn't have a precision to it. And therefore, you kind of know it when you see it when there's a qualitative situation 
where customers are buying as fast as you can supply them. Alternatively, it's when you're not in product market fit, when you're having to really spend a lot of money to get conversions. So with that, let's start with the first question I like to ask founders, which is, why are you doing this? Because this is not something that is easy. I've seen a lot of founders struggle, both in terms of the, the finances or, or family life or a lot of these things. And one of the things that becomes important when you're going to create this company, which is going to represent you and the product is going to represent you and the people you hire represent you, it's like, what is your vision? What are your values? What are the things that you're going to bring to the table and tell others about? And they're going to join you because of this. Um, sometimes people ask me, hey, look, do you guys invest in single founders? And yeah, of course, yeah, of course we do. We have like four investments in single founders. But I think one thing that really validates you just as much as having customers is your ability to recruit other people and to inspire other people to join you on what seemingly at the very early stages seems like something that's absolutely crazy. So you need to figure this out. Now there's a great, um, there's a great video um, in um, uh, TED Talks uh, by Simon Sinek. How many of you have watched this video? Okay, cool. Um, and it's really a good foundation for you to start thinking about this question of why you're doing things, which then helps create all the things and all the questions and all the attributes that later help you make decisions about who you hire, um, what are the basis that you're going to motivate them with, and what are the things that are going to define the product. And this is a, if, you want, if you're looking for the YouTube picture that represents the video, this is it. Okay, the next thing is around what positioning and um, what a brand is. And it's not just about a cheesy catchphrase. But before we go into what your brand and your vision represent, let's see who it affects, and it's your customer. So one of the concepts that I think has now been identified that is a, maybe, a, I'm not gonna call it a flaw, but let's just say it's something that needs to be added into the lean startup methodology, is this concept of a minimum viable segment. And what is a minimum viable segment? Whenever you hear a startup pitching something like, my product serves everyone, the problem there is that you do not have the cash most of the time to be able to target everyone. So by being very selective early on about who your key customer is, the more efficient you can be in both getting the right channels to acquire these customers, you have increased word of mouth, but more importantly, you have better differentiation from your competitors because your competitors might be trying to target two or three different sectors. All you need to do is master one and that becomes the foundation for you to cross that chasm, which Jeffrey Moore talked about in his book, Crossing the Chasm. So you really need to start thinking about identifying a minimum viable segment. Some people come and ask me all the time, like, what is it that I look for for a company to be part of Seed Camp? I want to know that you guys understand who your customer is and that it's a very differentiated group of people that can be the foundation for your high growth company. Here's an example of a company that is already huge and yet has a very clear subliminal message as to who the customer is. If you go to the Amazon Kindle website, um, not, the, not, the color, not the color one, the paper white, I think they call it, or the Voyage, look at the, all the images. I, I don't know if you guys want to crash the telecom, uh, the Wi-Fi right now, but let's, let's look at, um, maybe you guys look at it later, is looking at all the images that Amazon has selected, and you will see there's a lot of pictures of women riding the tube, or at the beach, and they've been very selective. Like this, this product is gonna be used by these people and I'm gonna inspire them to be able to conceive how it is that this product's gonna fit into their lives. So they've been very selective. And this is, I mean, you might say, well, that's not particularly selective. 50% of the global population is not very selective, right? But that's 50% more selective than sometimes other people are. And that's a company is making a, a mass consumer product they're still very much, if you look at even the titles of the books that they have selected for the spread, take a guess who the target demographic might be for those books. So that's just an idea for you to start thinking about segmentation. Now the next thing is positioning. Positioning is not just who you're for, but how you're making yourself be remembered in their minds. In a differentiated, in a, in a highly competed marketplace, 
differentiation is key. There's, there's going to be very, it's the most inefficient use of capital to try to convert people to use your product by simply throwing money at ad campaigns and hoping that people are going to come to your website. It's far better to say, look, for this group of people that have this particular thing, we are the best or the most convenient or the, whatever it is that you want to consider your key attribute. You differentiate for that group of people. It'll be so much more efficient for you to acquire them. And in some cases, well, when you can do this is by repositioning your competitors. So let's look at a couple of examples. The first example comes from the airline industry. Now, if you look at the history of Southwest Airlines, when it was created, it was done to replace um, the alternative, which was the commuter market. So if you look at, how many of you have heard of Southwest Airlines? Okay, so in the States, um, obviously there's a, lot, there's a huge network of, of highways. And so the, the route that Southwest Airlines started with was really trying to replace a commuter route that people were doing by cars. So if you think about their positioning, it was around repositioning the commuter ride with an airline ride. And what is it that you do when you're in a car, right? It's, it's relatively convenient. It's relatively low cost. So they knew that in order for them to be able to um, succeed in this venture of a new airline, they had to be very precise. They weren't going to be competing with American Airlines on traveling all over the United States. They just needed to replace the commuter market and really stand out. And their positioning statement was the short haul, no frills, and low priced airline. Why? Because they want people to know that this is something that is a viable alternative to commuting. And the decisions that the company makes, the decisions that the employees make, for example, they have a reputation of having very fun flights or, or the attendants telling jokes. Uh, and that's all partially because when you're, when you're trying to different yourself from, their custom, for, um, from your competitors for your customers, you're thinking, okay, I cannot increase my costs. I cannot bring in first grade food. What is it that I can make my experience stand out versus my competitors? And so they did a really good job with that type of positioning. Now let's look at another one. Quality versus experience. So these two companies are competing on the basis of um, a car, right? It's a car. We all would love to have a German car. But even within the German cars, they have to say, well, I'm better in one way or I'm better in another. So these two companies are competing on the basis of quality or engineering versus driving. So if you look at the statements, these are the statements from their um, sort of positioning statements. One's engineered like no other car in the world. What's the emotional reaction you're going for there? This is well made. This is going to last me, right? This is going to be maybe where my life or my family is going to be in this car. My kids are going to be in this car. So I want a well-precision engineer. I'd be curious to see what the demographic of purchasing based upon the statement would be. But every single decision that Mercedes needs to make is around engineering because that's kind of the way that they have decided to carve out that niche for themselves. BMW, on the other hand, has gone for this other variant, which is around driving experience. They've put the driver at least in the way that they communicate. Now, I think some stats I heard recently is that the people who are actually buying this are not the people who are into driving, but it doesn't matter. The, 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 the image that they're trying to convey is the experience as a driver. And so that's how two brands, for example, are positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis another in a very highly competed market, rather than both of them saying, we're the best car, we're the best car. Like those days when you could say you're the best at something and not take into consideration what your competitors are saying, those days are gone. So if that's how you're choosing to think about your positioning and your marketing, you're basically going to struggle. Now let's move on to your product. I'm not really going to talk too much about sort of the lean methodology and what a minimum viable product is because I think most of you already know what that is. But let's look at it a little bit more about what defines a product and what is um, all the components that define a product. There's a great video by Clay Christensen um, about hiring your product uh, to do a job. And it's about milkshakes. And he was trying to understand why it was that what, mil what job milkshakes were being hired for. I won't ruin the surprise for you, but the conclusion of, of, the, of the whole process, the surprise being the, the process, not so much the conclusion, the conclusion of the process is that milkshakes are hired to keep people entertained while they're driving. So they can't hire a donut or a banana because they're done too quickly. The thicker the milkshake, the more entertainment value you get in your commute to work. It just keeps you busy. And so you need to understand your customer and how you want to talk to your customer so that you can start building a product that fits the need 
Because if what you're thinking is people just need some food, you would have made the wrong product. And that means you need to think through the values and the customer's needs, such as the quality, the packaging, the messaging, the customer service. An example of the customer service is, is Zappos. Um, some of you may have bought shoes from Zappos, but one of the key fundamental things that Zappos has stood for from the very beginning has been this, this culture of customer service. And the reason why they've done that is because it's A, highly differentiated, right? How many other e-commerce providers that differentiate on customer service for shoes existed at the time? Not none that I can think of. But on top of that, it's, if you look at the values that they have on their website, it's around inspiring their, their employees to be able to provide this service of customer um, ha satisfaction. And they did a really good job of that and therefore built a product that allowed them to live up to this expectation they set in the customer's mind as their key positioning statement. Now, go to market strategies. I'm not gonna go too much into this because this is a huge umbrella. It, it, it includes everything from distribution channels to communications channels, sales strategies, direct, indirect, partnerships, and how you should price, bundling, freemium, all these kinds of things. But this is something that I'm gonna to touch upon later when I introduce the concept of the product market fit cycle. Lastly, there's another key component that you need to be comfortable with. How many of you here have heard of pirate metrics? Exactly, R. And the reason why it's called R is because it's acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, and referral. And that means that you need to start creating uh, metrics buckets to measure these aspects of your company's conversion funnel. Now, the thing is, each one of you have unique companies, and these companies are all going to have different attributes if it's a B2B company, it's a B2C company. And so this is just a starting point for you to think about the drop-off between one layer and the next. But if your company is making an exoskeleton, as I saw um, in one of the pitches earlier, this is gonna look a little different, right? Um, how many robots did you shoot down, for example? Might be a KPI. Um, so that's just something for you to think about. Every time you build out um, a, a product or a positioning strategy or a go-to-market strategy, you're gonna wanna quantify it. So now, I've covered all these things. Now let's bring it back to the beginning, which is we as, as, um, as builders are trying to get out of our habits of doing what we know and avoiding those things we don't know and sometimes getting stuck on not doing the right things. And so it's easy to miss these things. It's easy to lose track of who you need to be talking to. It's easy to not define who you wanna be and who you wanna be for it's easy to forget to think of your complementary go-to-market strategy for what you're trying to do, and it's easy to sometimes forget to track the right things. So, I'm gonna start introducing you now to this concept that I call the product market fit cycle, which is first you have to define your segment, the segment you wanna approach. And then you think as a unit about your positioning strategy, your product, and your go-to-market strategy. Those three things work as a combination. If you start thinking only in terms of your product and not about how you're gonna communicate it to your customers, you're gonna really struggle later when you do try to launch it and you haven't really thought through what your website's gonna look like. How is it that people are gonna convert, right? Think about if, if the Kindle were entirely made in a vacuum as an e-reader just on the features that the developers wanted in it without necessarily doing any customer validation and without testing to see who the customer segment that might buy this. So, now to the, the big reveal, I guess. This is a, a diagram that I came up with and you can, um, I think they're live streaming the, um, the event and in the, in, the, in the Twitter, there is a link to my blog post that has the explanation of this and then you can look at this picture in, in bigger detail. But, I, um, I drew this picture after having had a conversation with about three different founders one Friday evening in, in, at Seed Camp headquarters. And it was just trying to get around a lot of these patterns that all three of the companies were struggling with. And the story, uh, one of the, the stories that I like to tell was of one of our founders who was iterating his product and he was arguing with his co-founder about what features were likely gonna yield the better outcome because their conversion was not so good. And 
I challenged them to go and explore their positioning of their product and the way that they talked about it to their customer base because that the way that they were talking about it was very ambiguous. And all they did, all they did was fix the copy that was on their website. I know this is gonna sound ridiculous, but they went from having like a 0.2 or 0.5% conversion on that funnel to about 20% conversion, and then it stabilized down to about 8% conversion uh, over the course of the next 72 hours, just on experimenting with how they talked about their product. And then of course, putting in a little test on, um, on some of the advertising channels to see how the audience responded to it. So that's like a huge change and not by necessarily just focusing on the product, which is kind of the way that maybe the lean methodology sometimes overly emphasizes is like, oh, just build a product and test out a feature and see how it goes. You have to think about all the components as one. And so what this diagram tries to show is, you know, you start off with your big vision and your product hypothesis on the left. You then identify a, a customer segment that you really want to target. And then you build this, this bullet, as I call it, which is a combination of your positioning, your product, and your go-to-market strategy. And then you start testing that as a loop. But if something's not going right, you don't throw the entire thing out. You just pick certain elements to iterate on. It might be that you change your positioning a little bit. It might be that you change your go-to-market channels a little bit. It might be that you change certain elements of your segmentation but you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater as the expression goes. You can micro test certain bits of your strategy rather than testing out just one monolithic thing. And that is how you keep on iterating comprehensively targeting both the marketing aspects and the channelization aspects as well as the development aspects to maximize the amount of money you've raised. So, once your company hits product market fit, then is the right time to start scaling. Because if you don't, you start having this issue of inefficient scaling, where you're just throwing money at an inefficient machine. So the quicker you can hit the product market fit, the more the money you raise will allow you to unlock um, that growth curve that you really want, and also uh, get the attention of, of, of the investors that you, you want. So in summary, define your, your company's core values, and those core values will start you down the path of how you're gonna adapt your product to your customers as well as who you're gonna hire and what culture you wanna set. Define this minimum viable segment, define your bullet, and start going after a process of iterative testing and measuring and only look at one variable at a time or at least minimize the number of variables you're testing so you can more optimize around those variables. Rinse and repeat as far as you can go. And with that, Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Questions? We have one there. Where was it? Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask to define a minimum viable segment. How far should you go to segmenting the market? Yeah, that's a very, very good question because as with product market fit, the definition of the word, um, it's not particularly like defined. It's not like five people and technically could be like your best friends could be a, a segment, right? You could say the people that hang out with the university, right? And what was Facebook when it first started off? It was like a university minimum Bible segment. It was the kids in that university. So I think if you look at the Jeffrey Moore's uh, book on crossing the chasm, it's about having a group that's big enough such that you can then test out enough stuff. So a university is a group of people, maybe what, a thousand people? So if you can start thinking about something at that range as a, as a small segment, whereby if that product is successful in that segment, there are other adjoining segments that might scale, then that might be a sufficiently good minimum viable segment, right? Because Facebook went away from a university environment to a more sort of friend-based environment, and then it became obviously national, international. Any other questions? Questions? Really? You're so good at your products that you don't need to cool. answer a question. You're no, asking. but I mean, with, um, with regards to the Seed Camp program, I know some of you have come up to me uh, earlier and, and asked me, um, you know, what we do and how, how you can join. Um, 
four times a year, we have um, applications open for us to, to sort of include you into our Seed Camp Academy process. And so um, I know some of you were mentoring later, so feel free to stop by and, and, and chat if you want to, um, for me to, to talk to you in terms of joining our program. So I'll be around, and if, if any questions you have about Seed Camp, feel free to ask me later. Yeah, Monica. So connecting SeedCamp to your product market fit talk, um, where is the selection for SeedCamp stand to the life cycle of the startup you're selecting as product market fit? Yeah. Should they have reached that for no, you to no, no, consider no. them? Thanks. Thanks for that, Monica. Thanks for the easy question. Um, the the SeedCamp the seed camp program, including our newer, larger investments as well as the, the uh, sort of the younger pre-seed ones, is around helping companies that are pre-product market fit. So if your company is pre-product market fit, we're the program for you. And the way we try to do this is we try to find either founders who are really good and really experienced and really amazing, and we can back them in a pre-prototype situation, or if it's a, a, a neophyte team, a team that's doing this for the first time, uh, having a prototype is crucial. If you can have both, that's amazing. So. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking for companies that have revenues, uh, but I think there's a difference between revenues and customer validation and customer conversations that validate that what you're doing is meaningful. So that's kind of the stage that we're interested in looking at. Okay, thank you, Carlos. All right, thanks, guys.